You guys have heard of Wendy's, the restaurant, you know, the fast food place? Do you know why their hamburgers are so good? It's because when they make them, they don't cut corners. Now that might have went right over your head. See, the hamburgers are square. By the way, that was the world's worst dad joke one week ahead of Father's Day. How do you like that, right? Yeah. Uh, well, today we're going to be talking about cutting corners. What does this mean? What is a corner cutter? What, what does this mean when you cut corners? Well, the official definition that I could find is this. Uh, cutting corners is to skip certain steps in order to do something as easily or cheaply as possible, usually to the detriment of the finished product or end result. That sounds about right, doesn't it? So this message today, a would-be, a warning to would-be corner cutters, I beg your pardon, is a message uh, to the graduates that we're going to have here with us at the late service. But I think it's something we can all benefit from today. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a classic corner-cutting passage of Scripture. Two people that they cut corners big time when it came to the will of God. This story can be found in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. We're going to invite you to turn there at this time in your Bibles. Or, if you prefer, you can find it uh, in your app on your phone or your device. Or you can find it in our Pew Bibles on page 13. Genesis 16, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Genesis 16, 1 through 6, the corner cutters are named Abram and Sarai, later known to us as Abraham and Sarah. Here's the story. Verse 1, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. And there ends the lesson. Let's talk about this corner cutting that happened according to God's will by these two people, Abram and Sarah. Clearly they cut corners. They cut corners when it came to the will of God. Now you might say, how so? Well, in order to understand that, we have to know what the will of God was in this particular story. And that's not too hard to figure out. Just flip back a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. And this was the plan of God. What God said was going to happen. God called Abram and said to him, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. In other words, Abram was going to have a lot of descendants. A big extended family was going to come from him. Looking over at Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 
through 5. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward, and you shall be very and, and shall be very your reward shall be very great. I beg your pardon. But Abram said, Oh Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless. Did you hear that? Still childless, no kid yet. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Hmm. In other words, Abram, it's going to happen. You and Sarai are going to have offspring. That's my will. I'm going to get it done. It's going to happen. Okay. That's what God said. So what did they do? Well, according to verse, well, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 16, today's passage, they don't like how long it's taking for God's will to come about. No kid yet. No family. So they cook up another plan. What, what they do is they have this plan, and it, it's basically uh, Sarah's idea, is um, she says, you know, um, God has prevented me from bearing any kids. God's not, God's not allowing me to have kids. So let's do this. You go into my maidservant, and you have intimate relations with her, and then we'll have a family. We'll have a descendant that way. I mean, I can't believe that she was really happy with this plan. I'm not sure that he was either, but hey, we got to get this family planning thing going, and this is the best way that I can figure it out, Sarah says. And what does Abram do? Well, he agrees to do it, according to verse 4. He did it. Now, here's what you need to know. On the one hand, this might sound really weird to us today. Oh, my goodness, what do you mean? Having your husband go to your maid and producing a child through her. This was done very commonly in the ancient world, according to that culture. If you couldn't have children, you would find a way... Uh, to produce children like this. It happened a lot. Okay. But again, it was not the will of God. This is not what God wanted. No, no, no. What was the plan? Abram, you, you and your wife, you will have descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky, of the sand of the sea. That's the plan. But they devise a different plan. They devise a different way. Not God's way. Now, you might be wondering, well, why did they do this? Well, the one thing is they were probably getting impatient. Do you know how old these two were at this point? God says, sure, you're going to have this big family. Do you have any idea how old they are? I'll tell you, if you do the math by reading back through Genesis, she's 75 and he's 85. That's awfully old to be going to Lamaze class and babies are us. Really? We're going to have a kid at age 75 and 85? Oh, yeah, right. Let's figure out another way to do this. So they come up with this other plan that is not God's will. The other reason they do this is they have a stronger desire to do their will than God's will. We're not only impatient, so let's do it our way and not his way. Because we're tired of waiting, uh, waiting around for it. I'm going to do it my way. We're going to do it our way. Now what we need to realize is one of the things that happened here is that there was a lot of negative consequences of this. I mean, I mean if you look at verses 4 through 6, there's a lot of anger that goes on. The anger that Sarah has for Hagar, and Hagar is then mistreated. 
and, and, and the other thing too is Hagar really gets ripped off. Now, now I know it says in verse three that um, Abram, Sarah, Abram's wife took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Don't let that term wife fool you. Hagar was not a wife like Sarah was. She was a concubine wife. And as such, she got ripped off. First of all, a true wife in that culture would receive a dowry. A concubine wife did not. A true wife would be known as a wife. A concubine wife is a mistress. Inheritance would go through the descendants of the descendant, if you will, of the wife, the, the one, the firstborn, if there would be one. Now, in this case, that's not clear at all. It's just a big, fat mess. Everybody here is in topsy-turvy because it's a big mess. Anger, getting ripped off, getting treated, getting blamed. Abram, this is your fault, Sarah says, this big mess. You did this to me. And there's even, I hate to say it, some sort of abuse going on here because Sarah treats Hagar very harshly. It just goes to show that whenever you try to cut corners around God's will, you're headed for a mess, a big, fat mess. Now, there's other places in Scripture where people tried to cut corners around God's will, and it produced other problems, like, for example, a lack of joy in the case of David. What did he do? Well, you know the great story where he sinned with Bathsheba, did that terrible, terrible thing, and he was confronted on it. And he had to pray, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Because he lost his joy. He lost it. There may be more wrong choices that happen. Think about King Saul. What did he do? He got off on the wrong foot and he kept getting off on the wrong foot again and again and again. And it doesn't take much. All we need to do is cut a little tiny corner and that little corner that we cut can have so many, many repercussions as it comes to God's will. It's almost 14 years now, back in 1983, and many of you may remember the terrible tragedy that happened with the Korean Air Flight 007 that left Alaska and was headed to Seoul, South Korea. I don't know if you remember that story, but what happened was the plane took off and when they took off from Alaska to South Korea, they were off in their trajectory by one and a half degrees. That's it, one and a half degrees. And, you know, certain distance out, 100 miles out, nobody knew. I mean, you know, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. But as that plane was supposed to head this way, but rather veered to the north, do you remember where it went to? It went into Soviet Union airspace. That's back when the Soviet Union was active at that time. And you know what the Soviets did to that plane? Shot it out of the air. How many of you remember that story? Some of you do. I remember that very vividly. One and a half degrees. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And this is the point. Cut a little corner and you can be in for a lot of trouble. And the other thing that can happen whenever we cut corners around God's will is we can hit bottom. I think of the prodigal son in the Gospels, or in the Gospel of Luke, rather. What about that guy? Did he follow the will of God in that parable? Certainly not. And what happened? He hit bottom as a pig farmer, just wishing that he could even eat the pig food, whatever that may be. We could hit bottom as well. So I think that this is pretty clear that from this story that Cutting corners around God's will is not the way you want to go, whether you're a graduate or whether you're in 85th grade, whatever grade you or I may be in, 85, that might be a little bit high. Whatever grade we're in, whatever we might be in life, we don't want to cut corners around God's will. So the question is, how do you know what God's will is? Well, the first thing to knowing God's will that's very important is 
I believe we all need to have our hearts and minds have a good scrubbing and a good cleaning. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, tell us how this good scrubbing and this good cleaning can help us to know the will of God. And I'm going to read that for you very briefly. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Did you hear that? You can know the will of God, what is good, acceptable, perfect, complete, if you take some steps. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That refers to being committed to God's will and God's way. Lord, I'm yours. And then uh, not be conformed to the world, saying, no world, I'm not going your way. And instead, I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to have my mind cleaned out. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to look at my thought patterns. This is an excellent exercise, by the way. You know when you get in a really bad funk, whenever you're thinking negatively, or you're ready to throw in the towel, or you're just in such a bad way, just sit, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, what's going on in my head? What am I thinking? What is true? What is false? What's according to God's word? What is not? And whatever does not belong there, you get rid of it. It's kind of like, I'm sorry, I know this is disgusting, but it's like cleaning the gunk out of the bottom of the drain. Ugh. You got to get rid of the gunk. Or changing the filter in the air conditioning system. I thought maybe that's why it was so warm in here this morning, but I think it feels pretty good now. I hope you do too as well. Get rid of the gunk. Get rid of that which is clogging it up. Get it out of our heads. And when we do that, then we can start to figure out what the will of God is. So if we have our minds cleaned out, if we put ourselves before God and we have that pure heart and that pure mind, the question might be still, well, how do I know what the will of God is? I, I, I got myself cleaned out. I, I do want to serve God. I do want to be a living sacrifice. I don't want to be like the world. I, I've transformed myself by renewing my mind. So what steps can I take? Well, there's a couple we'll look at very briefly here. The first thing that we want to do, the base starting point is this, is that God's will is found first and foremost in his written word. Psalm 119, 105 your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's by the word of God that we know the will of God. You might say, how so? Well, let's say there's a graduate. And the graduate is so happy that he's done with school. It's over with. It's time to kick back and have a little fun. So he and his buddies get together and the buddies say, you know what? Let's go out. Let's party. Let's get smashed. Let's do it. We deserve it. And that young man may be a Christian and he's thinking, hmm, should I do that? Should I go out with my buddies? And should I get inebriated or smashed out of my mind like them? Or should I not? Maybe I need to pray about this. Buddy boy, you don't need to waste your time praying over that because it's already clear in God's word that you don't want to do that. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. It's very rare that I will tell someone, don't waste your time praying. <laughs> Most of the time you want to pray, but in a situation like that, you don't need to pray. The word has already told you. God's word tells you what is right. But that's with some broader things. There may be other things that we aren't sure about what's God's will or what's not. Going back to the graduates, should I go on to school? Should I take this job? Should I take that job? What should I do? What does God want me to do? Next thing that I would say is look for open and closed doors that come about. This happened with the Apostle Paul when he was serving as a missionary. 
all he really wanted to serve, to preach the gospel in Asia and Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit prevented him from going into those places. Shut the door somehow. But then there was that guy in Macedonia in that dream that he saw said, come on over here to Macedonia and help us. Where are the open and the closed doors? In other words, there are times that we may be beating our head against the wall trying to make something happen. And maybe that's an indication from the Lord. That's not where I want you to go. Find a different way. And that's okay. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. Another way that we may want to discover the will of God, and this one's a little bit more dangerous, and so you want the first two to inform this one, meaning the Word of God and the open and closed doors, and that is the inner prompting of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 20 and verse 22, Paul felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He did. Just something inside of him, he just knew that's what he had to do. Now, this is a very, very dangerous thing. If I'm having a bad day and somebody was mean to me or nasty to me, and I have some sort of inner prompting inside of me to go and be nasty to them, that is not the Holy Spirit. That's me cooking something up in my head that I shouldn't be. But in general, when we look to the Holy Spirit, we say, Lord, I just don't know your will. I know what your word says. I want you to leave me. Please open and shut doors. Now, would you show me what it is that you would have me to do? The Holy Spirit can give you a desire or even an inner peace when you see an open door. That's the will of God. And then the final thing that I would say is, Listen to the will of God through the counsel of wise and qualified godly people. Proverbs 12, 16 or 12, 15, I, excuse me, says a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Hey, believe me, there are many times that people had to come to me and say, George, knock it off. That's not what you want to do. You're going down the wrong path. Go this way and thank God for them because that was really, really good advice. See, this is how we know what the will of God is. And that's what we want to do. Clean the gunk out of our minds. Get ready to be open to the will of God. And then know the will of God through his word, through open and closed doors, through the Holy Spirit that lives in us and the wise counsel of others. And when we are pretty confident and we know what the will of God is, then do it. But cutting corners, that's not the way it goes. That's not the way that you and I want to go. There was a Southern Baptist theologian named George W. Truett that said this, To know the will of God is the greatest knowledge. To do the will of God is the greatest achievement. I think that's this message in probably two seconds. So if you look back to the title of the message on the screen that we started with, a warning to would-be corner cutters. What is the warning. The warning is this. When it comes to cutting corners around God's will, you and I don't want to go there. Rather, we want to test and approve what God's will is and follow his will at all times, for all reasons and all seasons.